Good. There it is. Take your Bibles if you would and turn them to Hebrews chapter 2. Pastor Aaron began this kind of the heart of Jesus from Philippians 2 and uh, in that, we were exhorted to have the heart that Jesus had, a heart that was a servant's heart, that was a, a, a humble heart, that was an obedient heart. Um, and we see in that, and we were challenged by that, just this reality of um, walking like Jesus walked, right? Like, you can't walk as Jesus walked without a heart like Jesus had, right? And um, And so... As we continue to move ahead and we think about some of that conversation we had last week in terms of um, really trying to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is, uh, what Jesus did, why Jesus did the things that he did, this morning I want to pose to you a different question that hopefully fits together as part of this uh, larger study of walking as Jesus walked, but I want to pose to you the question this morning, how real is your Jesus? And when I ask this question, please do not hear that in saying that you get to create for yourself your goal or your idea or ideal Jesus, okay? Who Jesus is and the reality of Jesus and all that was accomplished is not up for debate. You and I do not get to determine how real Jesus is. But we do get to determine how real the Jesus of Scripture is in our lives. And that's the reality of this question. Another way that maybe we could frame it is, how real is Jesus to you? Is he real at all? Is he real or relevant in some ways and in some areas? Or is he relevant in all areas of our lives. And this morning I want us together to see from Hebrews chapter 2 three realities of Jesus. But before we get to that, I want to probably tell you something you already know. Um, maybe you don't. There's a good chance if you're here, you know this. Um, at least in some way, some shape, some form, mankind was created to have fellowship with God. That means that you and I, in God's original design, were created to have fellowship with God. That is the sovereign, creating, sustaining, ruling God of the universe. You and I were created to have fellowship with that God. But I I trust this morning you may know, if you don't, I'll tell you, the ability of you and I to have fellowship with God was permanently altered when sin entered into the world all the way back in the very early pages of the Bible, chapter 3 of the first book of Scripture, Genesis. I trust you're familiar with the story this morning that God had created Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve were tempted to to take of the forbidden fruit. God had given them everything uh, for for their good. Uh, It was everything was subject to them, but they had one rule in this. We don't want to look at this as a here's a rule in the sense that. We think of rules today, like there's rules in our home, right? Like our kids have rules. And sometimes rules can be overbearing. Sometimes rules can be unreasonable. But most often time, right rules are for the benefactor or the, the one who the rule pertains to. That's what a good rule should be. And that was the one rule in the Garden of Eden. God was very clear with Adam and Eve Of all of the trees in the garden, you can eat. But this one tree, you cannot eat of it. Because I'm a monster and I want to rob you of joy. That's what Jesus, or that's what God said in the garden, isn't it? No. 
No, in fact, God, knowing what that tree signified and what was represented on the tree, he told Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree because when you do, you will surely die. You see, God was withholding no good thing from Adam and Eve. But there was one rule that was in place for their protection. And as long as you don't eat of this fruit, Adam and Eve, our fellowship will be perfect. The way that it's supposed to be, but we know that's not how things went. The Bible tells us that Eve was deceived by the serpent. She took the fruit, she ate. She gave the fruit to her husband, he ate too. And sin entered into the world. And with sin came death. Remember, God told Adam and Eve, when you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Adam and Eve, the moment they bit that fruit, were separated from God. Their spiritual death was done. In that moment, they were separated from God, spiritually dead. And also in that moment, they began to die physically. And when they ate of the fruit, God had to say, okay, here's what's going to happen now. And God in his goodness, God in his grace and in his mercy didn't say, well, that stinks. You guys ate of the fruit. Death is going to reign now, and there's nothing we can do about it. God said a few things, one of which we read in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now he's speaking to the deceiver. Now he's speaking. He's, it, it, this morning in, in in discipleship class, we looked at the, the, the verses, this, uh, a portion of this section of verses where Jesus, or excuse me, I keep saying Jesus, I mean Jesus is God, but where God spoke to Adam and Eve and said, look, here are the ramifications. You know, for, for, for Eve, your, your pain in childbirth will be multiplied and will be your desire to, to rule over your husband. For Adam, he said, you will now have to, to work by the sweat of your brow and, and what was once good and what was once not that difficult is now difficult. But he doesn't just pronounce a curse on Adam and Eve. He says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Big fancy word of the day. This is called the proto-evangelium. Proto meaning first, evangelium meaning gospel. This is the first time in all of scripture that the good news of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, Jesus, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We know Jesus was crucified. This was the plan of God. This was not a reaction. God knew what would transpire. And so he pronounces right then that one day... The fellowship that was broken will be permanently restored. This was the promise of God, that the devil would not reign forever, and that one day God would right what had just been wronged, and the sin that was now present would be removed. And all through the Old Testament, if you're familiar with it, there was a temple physical structure and there was a high priest a, a physical person who would act within the walls and confines of that temple as the one who would make atonement or payment for the sins of the people he would enter into that temple and specifically into the holy of holies or the most holy place some of our our translations say and in entering in there he would offer the high priest that is he would offer a sacrifice for the forgiveness of those who brought it this was how the people were to relate to God, by faith. By faith, they would come and they would bring these animals and the high priest would sacrifice them. You see, reality of this situation is that this was not the access to God that God intended for mankind to have to him. 
access to God was not intended to go through a person who would have to enact death and shed blood to be able to have access to God. But because of sin, this is exactly what we're left with. Sin had changed the reality of how it was people, because we're now sinful, can relate to a holy God. And part of God's plan, as we looked at in Genesis 3.15 a moment ago, was to restore access to himself of the people. It was to reestablish a relationship and to reestablish our ability to have contact with him. The promise of God was one day there would be a means, one day where the people could once and for all be made right with God. No more once a year sacrifice by the high priest in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, only to be done 364 days later once again so that your sins could be forgiven. The promise of God was that one day sin would be dealt with once and for all. And not only in sin being dealt with once and for all would mankind have the opportunity or would they be extended the offer to be made right with God, but they would also be able to relate to God. If if there's one area where I would submit to you today that the church really lacks in her understanding of following Jesus, it's in the reality that through Jesus, we have the privilege of relating to God. We have the privilege of having relationship with God. The same sovereign, creating, ruling God who Adam and Eve had relationship with. Now when I think about relating to God, or just relating to people in general, I don't know about you, but on the off chance for me, I very rarely watch the news. I've told you before, it drives me nuts. But on the off chance that sometimes I may see a form, some form of news, I usually find myself wondering if our political leaders live on this planet or another one. It seems so often that the people who were elected to represent people are completely out of touch with the very people that they're to be representing, right? Again, I don't know about you, but I know when I, when I see these things and I think through these, these types of scenarios and situations and circumstances, I'm usually left feeling one thing, discouragement. I think, how, like, really? Do these people hear themselves talking? Do they, do they understand the reality of people who are living and, and, and like, are we, are we on this planet right now? Sometimes I think we function in the Christian life this way. I think we go through life and everything's usually pretty hunky-dory, everything's, everything is okay, so we're not really forced to have to deal with any of these realities. But if we're honest, most people in the church, when again, when I say the church, I don't mean this one, I mean the church as a whole, function with no cognitive understanding of the privilege and ability that you have to relate to God and to be in fellowship with God because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done. Now here's the deal. Unlike a political leader, Jesus will not fail you. So our ability to relate to Jesus is paramount. We must understand when we, when we think of, of, of this relating to God. Sometimes, if we're honest, we might think, I don't understand what God's doing. I, I don't know what's going on, and I don't feel that I can relate to him, and I don't, I don't know this, or I, I don't know that, whatever it may be. If we're pressed, we can admit or acknowledge that we believe that the Bible says that Jesus is God. But you know, the Bible says it gives just as much attention to the fact that not only was Jesus God, but Jesus was fully man. The reality this morning is that if Jesus had not condescended heaven, came to earth, took on flesh, and become a man, we still could not relate to God. 
we would still be stuck in a sacrificial system that required an intercessor year after year after year after year to go to the the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice on our behalf. But Paul was very clear when he wrote to, to, to Timothy, wasn't he? There is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. If Jesus was not fully human, our hope of relating to God the way that God desired and designed for us to relate to him is not happening. I think oftentimes in our churches we neglect the reality of Jesus being fully human. And when we neglect the reality of Jesus' humanity, it leads to a disconnect between us and God. Without this regular being mindful of the humanity of Jesus and the, and, and, and the significance of that on our relationship to God, we, we kind of start existing in these classes. Well, there's God, and he's God, and that's God, and then there's us. And we just kind of exist. We have a disconnect. And I want you to understand something. When you have a disconnect with God for any reason, whether it's because you neglect the humanity of Jesus or for any other reason, you know what else you have with God? Discontentment. And suddenly we question everything. Suddenly what we may not understand but is perfectly explainable, we, 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 we launch ourselves into these situations and scenarios where suddenly now somehow God's on trial. And we're the judge and we're the jury and we're the executioner. And so we must understand that through the humanity of Jesus, we have the privilege of relating to the God of the universe. Once again, Jesus perfectly represents the people before God and perfectly represented God before the people. Everything that Jesus did and does is good, it is for our good, and it is for his glory. And his humanity matters because it's not only the means by which we're brought to God by faith, but also because if we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to be found faithful, then we must understand that Jesus was fully human on this earth. And followers of Christ, today, I want you to understand something. You can live as Jesus lived. You can walk as Jesus walked. Because like Jesus, you're human. Pastor Aaron waxed eloquently last week, Philippians chapter 2. Jesus did not cease to be God when he took on the form of a man. But he lived, functioned, and, and, and everything that he did to the glory of God, he did as a man, as a human. And in doing so, set an example. And this once and for all access to a right relationship with God on the basis of Jesus' humanity is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. In our, in our text this morning, verses 14 to 18 of chapter 2, when he's writing about the sacrifice of Christ as a human being. Christ had to suffer and die as a human in order to make payment once and for all for the sins of mankind or for humans. To save humans, he had to die as a human. And the great promise of Scripture is that because Jesus was fully human, he not only sympathizes with the weaknesses of humanity, but he enables mankind to relate to God in their humanity. Sorry, I hit the button. I didn't mean to. I want to read our text together, verses 14 through 18 of Hebrews chapter 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus, himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, 
He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Three realities this morning when it comes to or as it pertains to the humanity of Jesus. And the humanity of Jesus and these realities ought to compel and empower us to walk like Jesus. Reality number one, I saw you guys already saw it. He died. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he had to die. The only means of permanent restoration of sinful man to a holy God was the sacrificial death of the perfect, spotless, sinless Son of God. He had to die. But to die as, a, as God would not only be impossible, but it wouldn't have the same effect. To die as God would not allow Jesus or God to relate to man. Or to sinful man. So Jesus' humanity absolutely is of vital importance. And his death is, the reality of his death is ironed out for us in the few preceding verses. They tell us that the death of Jesus was necessary. Again, I know Pastor Aaron read part of this, or read all of this for the call to worship, but I want to read a couple verses. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the I and the children God has given me. Jesus, we see in this text here, had literally siblings. Mankind, there was brothers he had and they had a need. That need was salvation. We see also there that those brothers in need of salvation are humans made of flesh and blood. They live within bodies that are, are vulnerable and susceptible to corruption. They're liable to judgment. And therefore, they're slaves to the reality of death. And so what Christ did was humbly condescend to the point of taking on flesh and becoming like his brothers. Taking on human nature for the very purpose of dying on their behalf. Jesus could not have died as God. He had to take on flesh. It was necessary for the Son of God, though he was to be found in the form of God, thought equality with God was not something to be grasped. Pastor Aaron said this last week with us in Philippians 2. And he set aside, and he took on flesh, and he left his heavenly abode. It's interesting to me that as important to Christianity is, or excuse me, the important, that as important as the humanity of Jesus to Christianity is, most opponents of Christianity do not oppose this fact. I'm sure there's some. I know that there's some false religions that deny some of these realities as they pertain to Jesus. But most outward, you know, belligerent opponents of Christianity do not oppose the humanity of Jesus. Rather, they oppose the resurrection of Jesus. Much more time, energy, and effort has been given to denying that Jesus literally, physically rose from the grave three days after being crucified than to undermine his authority. But you see, Jesus' death was paramount in his claim that he was God in the flesh who had come to give himself as a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. 
Jesus was God in the flesh who had come for the purpose of sacrificing his own life in order to reestablish the relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden. And there's a reality that we know all too well in this world. You and I are subject to death and decay because of the presence of sin. And so we must understand the reality of the humanity of Jesus and its role in redeeming us. He became like us so he could be uniquely qualified to redeem us. When we talk about the gospel and we talk about death and we talk about Jesus dying on a cross, I would submit to you this morning that very rarely is our emphasis of the death of Jesus at the cross of Calvary in reference to his humanity. Maybe we just assume it. Maybe we just know it. But I want you to understand something this morning. Just because you may know it doesn't mean the people that you are engaging with know it. We live in a world with, that's filled with people that say, I don't need to relate to that God. What can God do for me? What has God done for me? Why do I need this? Why do I need that? He's way up there. I'm way down here. If he even exists at all, so whatever of it. There's that disconnect that's a result, or that results in discontentment. What has God done for me? He took on flesh. He became fully man for the purpose of dying out of obedience to the will of the Father. As a man, he died as a man to redeem man. The writer of Hebrews tells us elsewhere what that he could sympathize with us in every way. In every weakness, because he was God? No, because he was man. This reality of relating to God and having this relationship restored required Jesus to be fully human. And and the primary evidence of his full humanity was when he breathed his last and he gave up his spirit. And his lifeless body hung on a cross on the side of a hill where people looked on and mocked him, poked at him and made fun of him and criticized him. These were the manifestations of the reality that he was God who was fully man. And when he died as a man and the sky turned black, and the mountains shook, what did the onlooking centurion say? Surely this must be the Son of God. Reality number one of the humanity of Jesus is that he died. Pastor Aaron, he texted me this week, and he said to me, he said, my OCD is getting the best of me. Points two and three are complete sentences, but point one is not. Can we add some context to it? I said, no. Because the point is, in his humanity, reality number one is that he died. Second reality. In his death, he destroyed the power of the devil. Look at the second part of verse 14. We, f- we stopped with that through death. We stopped right there. Pick it up. He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Death is the greatest manifestation of the power of the devil. Death reigns supreme in the world that we live in because sin entered into the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And while Jesus did not take away the reality of the presence of physical death in this world now, 
His death did take away the power of the devil to wage death against believers or mankind really as a whole as a tool to overcome us and to achieve his victory. The grimmest of all realities in an earthly sense is that every single one of us is going to die a physical death unless Christ returns and we're still alive. And in the death of Christ, as a human, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that Jesus has destroyed the power of the devil, that is death. The grimmest of realities for mankind is that one day they will put my body in a box, those who love me will say goodbye, they will put me in a hole, and they will cover me with dirt and concrete. That's the grimmest of realities in this world. It has the potential to overcome people with fear, worry, and anxiety. The thought, and let me, let me, let me say this. For most believers, I don't think the death or the, the reality of death is what really causes us to be anxious, to worry, to have fear. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not looking forward to it per se. But when I think about the brevity of life, do you know what I think about? Well, what happens to my wife and kids if I die? I already know my wife's going to remarry. She's already told me, I can't live alone. So if you die, I'm getting someone new. Are they going to love my kids? Are my kids going to be taken care of? Is my wife going to be taken care of? Is she going to settle for someone less than me because she has to be with someone? That was a joke. These are the thoughts that often run through my mind. Not the reality of the presence of death, but some of the peripheral things. And then, you know, honestly, what I just try to remind myself, that won't be my focus when I'm gone. I love my wife and my girls. I give any and everything for them, including myself. But when I'm face to face with Jesus, I'm not going to be thinking about my wife. And I'm not going to be thinking about my girls. But see, the reality of the power of the devil as it pertains to death is that it captivates us. That the promise and the presence of physical death holds us captive. Oftentimes it takes us hostage. But the writer of Hebrews tells us that the death of Jesus has destroyed the power of the devil. Why is this? Because in Christ Death in this life is not the end. The week of vacation Bible school, before we went on vacation, some of you may know this, I, I spent Tuesday in Illinois, um, where we came from, where I was a youth pastor for almost four years, and a mom of some of the kids who were in our kids program and youth group, depending on their age when we were there, um, she died one week before her 48th birthday. Two youngest kids, twins, had just graduated high school. It doesn't really seem right, does it? You go there and you sit and you see this church. It's full of people and they're crying and they're mourning. And the reality that morning was that death is very real. And as much as we do grieve the presence of sin and death and all that it entails in this life, what gives us hope as we sit in that church last or two Tuesdays ago was the reality that that was not it. That was not the end. One day we'll see Susan. Why? Because Jesus has overcome the power of the devil that is death. Yes, we lament the reality of death. Jesus lamented the reality of death prior to his own death. Perhaps you've heard somebody preach John chapter 11 and Lazarus. Shortest verse in all of scripture, two words, Jesus wept. And maybe you heard somebody say, yeah, Jesus was crying because he was sad Lazarus died. Jesus was not crying because he was sad Lazarus had died. Number one, Jesus knew Lazarus was going to be alive in about three minutes. Jesus approached the tomb where Lazarus laid after he said to his sisters, where is he? He approaches the tomb and John sets the scene. 
doesn't he? He says that the people are mourning and they're weeping. And this has been going on for days and days and days. The beloved friend of Jesus had stopped breathing and was placed into a tomb. And Jesus wept because of the presence of sin and death. The lifeless body of Lazarus, Lazarus in a tomb was, was the, the, the outcome of the forbidden fruit being eaten. Jesus stood outside the tomb of his friend and he wept because he saw a world that was overcome by fear and anguish and death because of the presence of sin. But in Christ, this life is not it. The writer of Hebrews says here that Jesus destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. The word destroy can mean eradicate, but typically refers to nullifying or neutralizing or depriving of power. You see, Jesus did not eradicate death in his death. We still understand this reality. People die. But he did take away the sting of death. He did rob the devil of his primary power of overcoming mankind through death. Because if death is not the final say in this life, then the devil cannot wage death over our head as his victory. He has been defeated. Consider the words of Paul in his letter to the Colossians, Colossians 2.14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus was victorious over everything that the gates of hell could wage against him in his humanity. He robbed the devil, the deceiver, who got Adam and Eve to take and eat of that fruit. He robbed him of his power and his ability to hold you and I hostage. What a promise of God. And what a demonstration of the power of God. The record of our debt, Paul writing to the church at Colossae, it carries with it Legal demands, that's what we just read in Colossians 2. Literally, because of sin, the demand was shed blood to make a payment to appease God. But it couldn't be just any blood. It had to be blood from a perfect human. And Jesus shed that human blood, and in doing so, he disarmed the devil and all of his minions. The devil has been put to shame. Jesus has triumphed. And because this is true, the devil can no longer bring charges against those who trust Christ because the payment has been made. The demand has been satisfied and the devil has been disarmed. So the death of Christ not only disarms the devil, but it delivers mankind. Jesus disarmed the devil, reality number two. But reality number three, he delivers mankind. It says he destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. To deliver those who were in bondage under the promise of physical death. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, those who believe. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The death of Christ not only fulfilled the will of the Father, but it served to deliver mankind. Christ's death as a a real person, it yields deliverance to those who trust Christ. Let me phrase that. Christ's death as a real person yields deliverance to those who trust Christ. It yields deliverance from death and its power, its fear, from the wrath of God. 
I'm yielding to temptations. You believe that? Jesus, in his humanity, delivered you from death and the fear of death. I would submit to you this morning that I think there's a great chance that the greatest idol in our culture is our health. You ever seen some of the nutritious drinks people drink or things people eat in the name of health? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we shouldn't strive to take care of ourselves. We should. There's biblical precedent for that. We absolutely should. But why does the pursuit of the best health all the time, in every way, at every expense, captivate us? Ultimately, because what's the, what's the opposite of health? Was sickness. Oftentimes, what accompanies sickness? Difficulty, struggles, and ultimately, we know what the Bible teaches us, right? That it's appointed unto man once to die, like these bodies are going to fail us. This isn't all there is to it, but yet there's this reality that oftentimes we've, we have not understood that we have been delivered by the death of Jesus and his humanity from fear of death. Again, I want to repeat, I'm not saying we should be belligerent and forget about caring for ourselves. But can we be honest? Do we go to the lengths that we do because we're afraid of the alternative? And not just in the sense that we won't be in good shape, but the alternative that we could get sick and die. The alternative of being the pinnacle of our health as we can be would be that we're dead. And it's quite a statement, isn't it? That Jesus in his death delivered us from the fear of death. As we've noted, the fear of death and the reality of death holds most people hostage. Live their entire life in bondage to the reality that one day we will die. And honestly, I think that most people who have been in church for very long, they have an idea of what it means when they talk about their sins have been forgiven. But I don't, I'm not as convinced that we have the same understanding of what it means to live without fear of death because we've been redeemed. Believers, as we've said, ought not live in such a way that they're reckless and test the Lord. But we don't have to be captivated by fear and death because death is not the last word. And, and you know, I do want to say this, and I'm guilty of this, so... This isn't me pointing the finger at anybody. But you know one of the greatest realities or manifestations of living our lives in fear and worry of death and the effects of death and these kinds of things? Control. If you know me very well, you know I like to have control. Because I know better than God. Because I'm smarter than God. Because I'm more powerful than God? None of those statements are true. And yet, day after day, if I'm not careful, if I'm not paying attention, I will function in such a way that says I'm captivated by the promise of physical death in this world and my quest to have control over everything in my life. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in chapter 15, he says this, and as it pertains to death, we've been delivered from the fear of death. He says, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. As long as we live our lives for the glory of God, we can know death has been defeated. And if you've trusted Christ for your salvation, you've been delivered from the sting of death and its fear. Do you believe that this morning? 
The humanity of Jesus frees us from living in bondage and in fear of the reality of death. We've also been delivered from the wrath of God. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to be the payment, to be the one who would absorb the just, holy, righteous wrath of God. Once again, Paul writing in Romans chapter 8, he says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the thing of the spirit. Do you live as though there is no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus? Have you set your mind on the things of the Spirit? Do you live, function, and operate within the influence, under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God? Because those who are in Christ and live their lives for the glory of Christ under the leading of the Holy Spirit of God in combination with the Word of God, listen, you understand what Paul says? When you're in Christ and you live out, out, out of subjection to God and what he's revealed in his word, there is no condemnation. It's done. It's sealed. It's taken care of. It's solved. It's finished. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ the reality of the death of Jesus is that he has delivered mankind we are not under the wrath of God. We are not awaiting the judgment and the punishment of God because Jesus in his humanity took it. He delivered us from the wrath of God. And lastly, he delivered us from yielding to temptation. It says, for he himself has suffered when tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus, in his humanity, was tempted. When we know Luke 4, Matthew 4, both, they literally have sections of Scripture that are called the temptation of Jesus. He was tempted. The writer of Hebrews would say he was tempted like us in every way, yet was without sin. Again, referencing the Apostle Paul. He wrote to the church at Corinth once again in chapter 10, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I want you to understand something. If Jesus has delivered us from the reality of being overcome by temptation... 1 Corinthians 10, 13 does not mean God gives his toughest battles to his greatest warriors. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 does not mean you will never be tempted to sin because Jesus has delivered us from the power of yielding to that temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, nothing that you encounter is going to be new or unique to you. Or in the sense, it might be new to you, but it's not new or unique. But God is faithful even in your temptations. How is he faithful? Does not let you be tempted beyond your ability? Does that mean if we give in to the temptation, it's God's fault? He tempted us too much? Paul says, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. The deliverance is not a promise of no temptation. The deliverance through the death, burial, and resurrection of 
the Son of God, man in the flesh, Jesus, is the reality that you may have to endure the temptation. But because Jesus in his humanity died, you have what you need to overcome temptation. You have what you need to endure whatever is set before you. When I think of the word endure, I think of exactly what Aaron preached last week. For what was before him, Jesus endured the cross. That literally means he went through what was necessary to purchase salvation. He endured. He went through the process of crucifixion. You may need to go through the process of resisting temptation. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you can. You can. Because you have a high priest who was tempted in every way yet was without sin. Understanding the humanity of Jesus is vital to the spiritual life, the spiritual health of those who profess to know Christ. Because salvation, the salvation that we, the Bible teaches us we have in Christ and through Christ, is not from an inanimate object of whimsical being and wishful thinking. Salvation is from the Son of God who took on flesh for the purpose of fulfilling the plan of the Father, redeeming sinful man to the glory of the Father. And this plan was fulfilled by a human so that he could be uniquely qualified to reunite humans, man, to God and reestablish the relationship that was broken. Because of the humanity of Christ, believers, they can commune with God. And the reality of Jesus in your life determines the depth of your relationship. I want to restate that. The reality of Jesus in your life, that's the question this morning, right? How real is your Jesus? The reality of Jesus in your life is determined by the depth of your relationship with Jesus. You see, if the Jesus of Scripture is little more to you than a ticket to not go to hell when you die, then your communion with the Father is probably shallow and lacking, and you are probably living in bondage to the reality that one day you will die. If this is how you regard Jesus then you most likely have not understood that you are free from the penalty of sin and death. And instead of fleeing from them, you run to them. But if Jesus and his humanity is real, then your freedom and your restoration to the Father are far more than just a cognitive understanding, or as we referred to a moment ago, a ticket out of hell. If Jesus and his humanity are real, then for the church, they should be life-giving, enabling you to freely run to the Father and to rest in the finished work of the Son because sin has been defeated and the power of sin and death no longer has dominion over you because you have been delivered. How real is your Jesus this morning? The goal is complete restoration in the next life. But this life is a foretaste of the life that is to come. How real is your Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the reality of the humanity of Jesus. I thank you this morning, God, that Jesus came and that he suffered and he died living a perfectly obedient life, God. Clearing a way for our relationship with you to be restored. Paving a way for us to be made right with you. Making it possible for us to commune with you. But God, also in his humanity and in his death, God, may we grow in our understanding of the reality that the devil and death have been defeated. This is not just a reality for Easter. 
the devil and death being defeated are paramount to the Christian life. God, help us today to see that in the humanity of Jesus and in his defeat of Satan and his tactics, the cross of Calvary, God, those who place their faith and trust in Christ have been delivered. We don't have to live in bondage to the promise of physical death. We don't have to live in fear of absorbing your wrath ourselves or God, in, uh, in a sense where we're overcome by temptation. God, we've been delivered by so great a high priest, Jesus, who can sympathize with our weaknesses, yet was without sin, rendering him uniquely qualified to redeem sinful man. God, impress upon our hearts today the reality of being restored into a right relationship with you through faith in Christ. Impress upon our hearts today, God, the reality of being free. Help us, God, to look to you, to desire that communion and that relationship, God, that you have made possible through Jesus. May you strengthen us. May you build us up. God, may you encourage us. May you draw us near to you. God, that we could be a little more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. And that we could rest knowing we're free. In Jesus' name we pray.